Welcome to the Market Geometry uh, Morning Sessions. Uh, I forgot to hit the record button. Button. It's November 11th. <laughs> We've been talking about 15 for about 15 minutes or so. You haven't missed anything though. We we're just doing administrative things. So anyway, uh, today is Hump Day. Cheer up. Halfway through the week. Let's see if we can uh, get to the markets and uh, find some interesting things. There you go. So we're going now. All right, so somebody wanted to talk about this market. All right, here we go. If you take a look here, and we talked about this briefly, let's reiterate what we were talking about yesterday. This is a weekly Euro FX. Uh, this is one entry that you might have considered because you got a beautiful test. Let's go back and look and see where it's drawn from. I'm sorry. Let's start out at the beginning. Major low. This is it. The low low. Now think of this as a center line in terms of action reaction. And you can see all the hits. It's a multi-pivot line. Touch, 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 touch. Look at all the touches in here. Touch, touch. This certainly describes the action on this tail. Okay? All the way up. Then, now I'm going to open it up. Unless anybody has a disagreement about it. Now, we draw this in. Price comes all the way down. The beauty is, take a look at it, it tests the median line, so it fulfills Dr. Andrews' 80% rule. And it tests it with a beautiful wide range bar inside. Outside bar closes lower. Wide range bar heads lower, comes down, tests the lower median line parallel wonderfully. Let me open it up some more so you're all with me. Test it beautifully down here and look at the separation on the close. That should tell you that there are buyers down here. And remember, the limit buyers, the guys that want to get long, after that long run up, they're looking for the pullback. This is where the orders are to get long. Okay? Price comes down again. Let me just say it again. Tests. Closes with great separation. Separation for those for Christian, for example, anybody that's new, separation is where it tests the line or the low, and then where it closes. That shows you that the buyers are in control. So at that point, if you can find a stop that works for you, and remember, we're talking about weekly charts, not dailies. Look at the range on a weekly. This one goes from 147 all the way down to 133. It's 300 or 3,400 points. That's big cha-cha. AK says, there's a nice upsloping trend line from retest of the low to the next low upwards. Okay, yep, I'll give you that. Then, price comes up takes out this high, but closes lower, doesn't test the lower median line parallel. If you were actually trading this, you would have to adjust. If you wanted to get long on this bar and you didn't get filled, you'd have to adjust your, your entry uh, just a tiny a bit. Now, if you didn't like the size of the stop, this is where the limit orders are to buy. Let's play devil's advocate for a second here. Once that bar closes, you'd measure with your cursor, and you want would you want to be along at 125, basically 50. Your stop has got to be below this low at 123.16. So it's 200. Unless my math is incorrect, which is certainly often the case these days, 225 pip stop. If you cannot stomach. Again, it's a weekly now. Um, I'll answer that question in one second, Christine. So this stop, 
would be one. Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put it over here. I'll try and put it over here. There we go. Let's make this blue. It's, it's important for us to just talk these through, especially the long-term stuff, because most of you don't do these. And this should not bleed into your intraday trading. This is a different type of technique. A lot of times you're only going to get one stab at it, okay? So this stop is 122, oh, I think 75. I'm going to write that down just for a second. I think I have that right. Let me just double check. Yeah, that's fine. This entry is 125.60. And I'm painting with a broad brush. It might be plus or minus 5 or 10 ticks here. But you get the idea. Now, if you can, if you, again, these are weeklies. This bar is 3,400 ticks wide. If you can't stomach 200 and whatever that is. I understand that. 285 pips, six John says. Okay, I got a lot of questions. Slow down. Well, AK says good for an options trade. Well, I don't do options trades because I'm bad at the options has a, you know, a third or fourth, you know, has volatility and has other things in there. And I I'm while some of you might be very good at it and some of the people that I mentor are very good at options directional trades using pitchforks. And I certainly teach them that. I teach them how to get in. Um, I've found that I'm just better with simple directional outright trades. That's all. Yep. If you, in AK, it's exactly right. For those who know and can, should. I, I absolutely agree. If you don't, you may just be peeing away your money. The micros would be one option. Cash FX would be another option. And somebody said, one second. Uh, da -da -da. Position size with this trade. Do you tr always try to risk an equal dollar amount per trade? Yes, I do, Joe. I use what's called equivalent risk sizing. And I base everything based on 30-day T-bill futures, even though they don't trade anymore. You can, you, can equivalent to, you can equivalent them to anything, but it doesn't matter. Kurt, how are you? Says, I don't see much difference between weekly and minute entries except the size of the stop. You're absolutely right, Kurt, except for one thing. The difference between weeklies and minutes is on a minute, if you look at a lot of minute charts, you'll find that there are a lot more pivots and there's a lot more noise. When you trade on dailies and weeklies and monthlies, you'll get very, you'll get much, many, good, good to English today, you'll get fewer entries. Yes, Paul, thank you, Paul. With minutes, you're likely to get retests, and weeklies, you're much less so, in my humble opinion. How Paul says that's exactly right. Thank you. Does a retest make you nervous since you typically don't get retests in large time frames? No, Ryan, I don't even care. Here, when I trade a weekly, I just put my order in. That's fine with me. Go do what it's going to do. If they're going to stop me out, here's, here's the way I portfolio trade. Until I learned to trade this way, equivalent risk, downsize, the amount of leverage you're using so that you can actually trade this way. Here's my stop. Come and get me. Stops are my friend. They're there to save me, okay? So, because if you're correct, generally, you get one stab at this. So if it comes back down again and makes a new low, you're wrong. Just take me out. Now, here's what I started out to say. If you can't stomach this 122.75, this 285 pips, you can pass on the trade. Nothing wrong with that. Then, when it leaves this nipple right here and this weekly bar closes, 
this scouted out this area and if you haven't taken a seminar yet scouting out means it any of the stops that were down here because of this prior low right here you see this little prior low here where we did test the lower median line parallel some people left stop loss orders here either they got long and left stop losses or they left orders to get short if it took out that law low this is almost a wash and rinse if you think about it this way it came down any stop loss orders there were to sell this blew them out so they scouted out and scoured the area so now this area is clean when this closes leaves this nipple down below scouts out the area then moves back above and closes again with good separation again run your cursor and say hey you know what if it gets to this lower median line parallel I'll buy now at 125 now let's say it's I wish I could see better well it's really, you know what it's it's only moved up about five pips I'll buy now at 125.65. So especially if I could type. And now my stop, let's take a look at the low. Let me move this over. 124.52. So now I got a completely different story going on. Now my stop is 124, I don't know, and a quarter, something like that in order to preserve this little bingo here. There we go. Now, so you couldn't, st let's say you couldn't stomach this C. Now you see it come in and blow out all the stop loss sellers. If it closes the separation, you should be looking at your chops saying, boy, if it gives me an opportunity now, now I can buy at the lower median line parallel. Put my stop underneath this nipple because the stop loss sellers are gone. And I've, only, I've got a much tighter stop. And on a weekly, this is not, it's nothing. Yeah. Okay. Nothing. George says 115. Ixon says 140. Anywhere in between there. On a weekly, that's a nothing stop. Actually, even the even the 285s on a weekly is almost nothing. But I'll tell you what, 115 to 140 on a weekly euro chart is a nothing. 140 is correct, George says. That's nothing. Now, it sounds like a lot to you, but remember, if you're going to get in this trade, you're talking about a trade that's going to take months to unfold, not weeks. Months. And you're not looking for 200 pips. You're looking for a move from at least... You, you don't want to get in this trade unless you get at least 5 to 1. So you're looking for a test of the median line. You're looking for something. A re, what you're really looking for, to be honest, is to fill this rim. At 147. So you're getting long at 125 to get out at 147. That's 22. So you're talking about... 18 to 1 ish, something like that, is there a carry charge with this pair? Uh, Euro interest rates, I believe, are higher than the United States. Somebody correct me if I'm incorrect. So you're long the Euro, short the U.S., you'd actually be earning. When and do you roll over your contracts? Well, if you're doing cash FX, I just put them out three or four months. And what I do is I just ask, it's called swaps. You just ask the swap desk, you know, I'm going to carry this for three, four, five months. What gives me the best per day carry? They'll tell you because it varies. It doesn't vary by much, but it varies. Otherwise, if you're doing, you know, the, the uh, CME, what I would call the IMM, the CME contracts, you do it the week before they be become the front contract, just roll it over. Just tell your broker, hey, when it's time to roll the, that, that week, just roll it over. And just leave it over. Now, somebody says, and you look at this chart only once a week. El Ixan, 
that would be the smart way. I would look at it. I would actually look at it every night and just make sure um, the orders are in and correct. But yes, you, the best way to deal with this is look at it every night. Now, when it gets, take a look. If you manage to get long at either one of these, when it sprints up here, you want to collapse the risk. And I'd go to break, if you were long here or here, either one, I'd go to break even at that point. Just collapse the risk. It's over. If it takes those out, you don't want to play anymore. When it comes down and leaves this low and takes out that high right here, takes out the double tops, then go under here. Now you have a stop profit. At something like 127.95, so the worst thing's going to happen is you're going to make 250 pips ish. So and now you can just stop worrying. If you get really excited and you're worried, you can move it here again, right here. And I don't know that I'd move it again after that. The rest of this is not very clear. And you have two possibilities. There's, look, there's nothing wrong. If it got up here and left double tops, there's nothing wrong with you saying, if it got back up there, I want my money. There's nothing wrong with that. But your real targets are either filling the canyon rim or the median line. And those are your two possibilities. You may still be in this rate. You might have multiple targets. Depends on how much you have. How much under those are those stops? I basically go about 50 pips under a swing on a weekly, something like that. Do I think this is going to fill the canyon all the way up? Stoyan, you ready? Three double O. I may fall short by a few euros, but I don't think I'm going to be too far off. When things start to fall apart in the, again in the United States, there's going to be a major run on the dollar. And unfortunately, no, Christian, I do not think that's the stock market at all-time highs. I think it's exactly the opposite. When the stock market goes down and nobody wants to hold our bonds or we default on our bonds, there'll be a run on the dollar, in my opinion. Is the euro really in that much better shape? No, it's not. I don't think it is, Chan. I agree with you. But I think it's the lesser of two evils. How's that? <laughs> Will this cause the mortgage break? God, I hope not. <laughs> uh, it's based on, is, this, is there a technical basis for this euro view, or is it just based on broad fundamentals? Take a look at this chart. Are you ready? Christian, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I'm sorry. I know you're new here, and I don't want to be mean, but here you go. In nominal terms, might be. Correlation is better than 90% euro to the U.S. dollar versus the stock market, you think. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to tell you that you are incorrect. If you'd like to present... 20 years of statistics to show that to me, or at least 8 years since the euro started trading, I'll be glad to admit that I'm wrong, but that's just not the case. Sorry. That There is no correlation between the dollar and the stock market. There's no correlation between the dollar and bonds. It's just, just the way it is. That's what people want to believe, but there's no correlation. So, here we go. Would I trade a 240-minute chart the same way as a daily, weekly, and monthly? Yes, absolutely, David. It's just the stops will be smaller, and you see slightly more pivots. But, yes, absolutely. So now here we go. As a, as a, as a point of reference, Marischal managed to look 15 years out using just technicals. That's right, Paul, and that's exactly what we're looking here. Here we go. Now, and I don't pretend to be George Marischal. I told you guys yesterday, let's be honest, I think I'm one of the better chartists alive today, if not the best. Certainly my hand charts. My hand charts next to George Marischal. 
oh man, it's like a guy painting Velvet Elvis versus Monet. Yes, he was that good. You've only seen one of his charts. I have 10,000 of his charts. 10,000. They will be up at the Milton Friedman Institute, which is the new business school for the University of Chicago. That will be the artwork for the research hall. How about that? John Rich says, 72.6% of all statistics are made up on the spot. And, of course, I think John just made that up. Did he know Elvis? No. I know. I, I didn't even know Elvis. Okay, here we go. Ready? Let's just do a stupid. Let's just do stupid projection. And I haven't done this yet. I'm making it up. Here we go. Ready? But high, major pullback. Let's look at the one-to-one. -one. Let's, let's try and figure out where the heck the one-to-one -one goes in. One-to-one -one gives you two. <laughs> How about that? 1.618 gives you 2.5. I'm not looking too awful. Now, some of my hand-drawn stuff have better projections than this. Paul's saying <laughs> he's only got a week, you know, he's got three weeks left on his you're going to parody prediction, but he's starting to get a little shaky in his prediction now. Here you go. Um, uh, here you go. David says, it would be great to figure out how to copy a few of Marichelle's charts and put them on the website. Let me just give you a quickie. Here you go. Mark says he'll have to wait for six years for that to play out. I'll be dead by that. I don't think it'll be six years, Mark. And I don't think you'll be dead, by the way. Uh, Krishna, I, I have media lines that do similar things, but I just don't have one in front of me. Um, <coughs> uh, where, where, where was I? Um, Marichelle's charts. Marichelle's charts and the Babson and, and Andrews and Marichelle papers. Um, we, have a co we have a copyright complication. At the, at, at the moment, they're all being treated for acid... Uh, degradation at Stanford University at the Hoover Institute. The papers will be, di they're being digitalized um, and they will be shared um, I put them all in a trust I paid, I can't, you don't want to know how much I paid um, they will be shared between the Hoover Institute and the new Milton Friedman Institute at the University of Chicago and this is a thank you to Milton Friedman who was my mentor uh, when I went to school and um, the University of Chicago is very anxious to have something completely different for artwork and they just love the idea of Marichelle's charts. They've asked me to put my charts up there as well. I told them as soon as I'm dead they can hang my charts. In terms of me publishing in terms of me publishing any of the Marichelle work and or the new, you know, the six look there's a guy that sells, he says he has 300 pages of Andrew's work. He'll sell it to you for 12,500. I have 600,000 pages. Okay. And, and counting what we're going to do is it's being digitalized it's being saved first that takes forever it takes forever to de-acidify de -acidify this stuff then it's being digitalized but we're in a, we're in a last, the last part of a copyright clearing because universities are involved they have to be very cautious that this stuff is all copyright free and there are two manuscripts in there that we have to get the court to rule on because there's another uh mega technical analyst from the period involved that made a settlement with Andrews and Babson and because of it they have a manuscript that's included in there and so it kind of entangles the whole mess how did I get my grubby fingers on it George Marichelle's third wife sold me everything your guess is correct Eduardo but I'm not going to say it out loud Why are hand-drawn charts different, better than what you are doing now? Uh, there's, there's something intuitive about them. I'm not really sure. Um, I can, Krishna, but Krishna, you have to remember. Let me, for people that are asking me to do some interesting things, like, for example, could I take some pictures and post this? Could I do this or that? You have to remember, please, stop and think for a second. And you have all been extremely patient. I appreciate it. But remember... Yeah, my, that's a good point, Ron. Yourself, yourself or myself is in the chart. That's exactly right, your personality. You have to remember, I'm coming off of seven weeks of living hell. And to keep momentum going, 
I decided to do the morning sessions, okay? So, at the moment, we're going to have family meetings this weekend because I want you all to understand where we're going. And then, next week, I will be meeting with everybody that's in mentoring and group mentoring because I have to completely redo my schedule. So, I do not have the ability yet. I haven't even started hand up, up re-updating my hand charts. I have seven and a half weeks of data to put on. So, I'm a little behind. You're going to have to be patient. Hand charting, I think, is like the difference between driving a car in a computer game and on the road. That's right. You feel the market rather than observe it. I would agree with that. Yeah, there's something with hand-eye coordination. I don't know what it is. You know, it goes right up your arm. Hand inscription is the highest form of memory, Matt says. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. So we got the basic idea. You can see where my numbers are coming from. There's also some action-reaction things, not really median lines in this. And remember, prior to 2000, the euro really didn't exist. Okay? You all know that, right? Yes, it was, the, yeah. The proxy was the Deutschmark. So what I've done... Because, to be honest with you, prior to 1995, I was the king of the Deutschmarks, and certainly in the North America. And the people that watch my orders in the other two time zones were the kings of Deutschmarks, if it were, so to speak. Um, I've taken that data, uh, amended it onto Euro charts. Forget this baloney over here. And that gives me some wonderful projections. It's not hard to do. But anyway... you. You get the idea of, uh, I mean, there are different ways to look at this thing. But the idea is, the 3.0 3 is not that, not as crackpot as it sounds. And here, here's kind of what may happen. Did you pick a date and time for the meeting? I'll put it on the website. But one is going to be Saturday morning. Okay, here we go. Golf 101. The optic nerve is three times larger than any nerve. That's why people are visual learners. I like that, Ross. I didn't know that. All right, here we go. <laughs> Isn't it funny? We're here. We here seem to be putting more value on what they can't see, Marichal's charts, to what's in front of us. Me, me Tim, a great teacher. Oh, thank you, Shabir. I appreciate it. You know, uh, yeah, you'll see Marichal's charts, and they'll help you. They'll be fine. Um, but, you know, I do my best to anything I learn to, to, you know, to pop it onto my work. Um, and show you, and I and I give credit when you see it. So, well, I know I'm not trying to tease you when I talk about them. I'm just I can't help it because every time I see them, I go, oh my god. Um, sorry. Men need to see when women need to hear. There you go. <laughs> um, I ran out of steam there for a second. Let me think here. Let's just change charts. But you get the idea. We're not far away. Uh, how do I think this could play out? Here's how I think it could play out. I read an interesting statistic yesterday. We have now printed enough money between George Bush in his last six months and now Obama and Geithner and friends that we've gone, we are now at 42% of GDP sitting in bonds already. 42%. Does that scare anybody? Okay, now wait. Wait, I'm not done. Okay, now, well, I'm not done yet. The projection is what is normal? Well, we were running at 5 or 6% and people were scared. Peter, how's that? Yeah, that's debt. That's right. We were running at 5 to 6%. Now we're at 42. That's what they've done in the last whatever. <laughs> now, well, we'll talk about where we moved in a second. Let me, let me make it worse for you. The projection is that by 2012, if Obama does what he wants to do, We'll be at 82. I'm getting there, Dave. You're going exactly where I'm going. We'll be at 82% of our GDP in bonds. Eight, 
82% of our GDP in bonds. Professor Friedman would say this. Ready? That's a good question, Christine. Or, no, I'm sorry, there was a word. 136 years to pay it off if nothing more horrible happens. There you go. <laughs> Professor Friedman would say 100% growth in money supply gets you 100% inflation. So the only way out of this is to repudiate the debt. Period. Tell everybody, you know what? We ain't paying. Period. It's happened before to every major country except for two. Well, you know, it's happened to everybody. Yeah, Paul says, Zimbabwe, here we come. Now, here you go. If you think that's bad, and, da and David mentioned this before I said anything. Ready? Japan, at the moment. Japan, at the moment, is at 300% of their GDP already. Now, how are they going to repay that? Well, Eduardo says he, th he thinks I'm wrong. He thinks it's 200%. I actually got it from a famous economist yesterday at 302%, by the way. But I'll call it 200%. How's that? <laughs> I'll give you the, I'll, I'll say I'm wrong by 100%. Okay? How's that? <laughs> so... I am done. I'm, I'm actually giving you the real number. 302%. Bring back the gold standard. Well, that's one possibility. But if you're going to bring back the gold standard, Andy, that's fine. You're going to have to fix the bond problem. 300% in government bonds. That's the number he quoted me. Now, if you can't pay the debt, and somebody up there, somebody up here just said it a minute ago, uh, a debt that can't be repaid won't be repaid. I agree. Someone else said that the NPR said that someone on the Fed is working on it. Well, of course they're working on it, but what are you going to do? The gold standard is now the China standard. That's not a bad comment. What are you going to do? I can't, you know, as an economist, and I don't like to wear that hat very often, I don't see an easy way out of it, do you? Hit print and then a trillion copies, Paul says. Well, that's what they've been doing every day. That's the guy working at the Fed, yes. Hit it, hit print, hit print, hit print. How long do you think Japan has till it blows up, till the next downturn? When the next serious economic downturn comes, I think they might blow up. Remember, there's been a change in government in Japan. They've gone from pro-West, I won't say they're anti-West, but they're not happy about us. So they may, they may just tell us to go just shove it, so to speak. If they go, Michael Jackson says, God, Michael, Michael, don't say this. If you want to know how good the economy is, try to sell a house, because I have to try and sell a house shortly. Don't say that. You're going to scare me now. Anyway, why don't I volunteer to trade for the Federal Reserve? I used to, Daryl. I traded for the Federal Reserve for 20 years. They were terrible to trade for. Demographically, they've lost their youth. Who will be left in Japan? Well, I think basically um, they've decided that the Western ways are wrong, and I think uh, there's going to be a movement, just like there is in Korea, to go back to the Eastern ways, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do. So, if the U.S. defaults, would the euro become the leading currency for oil and such? I think gold and whatever the Chinese currency, if they ever float, would be. Who's buying their debt? Not me. Uh, Ryan, you made a great thing. If I could do, if I could talk my wife into this, I'd do it. You should rent in Arizona. Yes, I. If I could talk my wife into doing it, I would. Anyway, that's the thought behind this. They're now the largest hold, holders of U.S. bonds again. There you go. Rent an option to buy. Yeah. Well, anyway, the uh, AK says there's another Chinese hint on floating on their own. Yeah, it's coming. They're already issuing bonds. So if they're issuing bonds that you can buy outside the country, you know they're going to float. Otherwise, they wouldn't be issuing the bonds. They're trying to sneak those bonds out there and get as many as they can before it floats because it's cheaper at the moment. 
it'll it'll happen and it won't be that long from now anyway wait till the commercial real estate shoe drops it's coming can we see the end sure let's look at the end good idea let's look at a daily <clears throat> gee it's right there in front of us let's look at a weekly Let me fix the chart. <clears throat> Should go back further, but let me just double check if it may not on this machine. There you go. Much better. That's back to 1997. So <clears throat> here we go. The Japanese are uh, one-upping us, so to speak, saying things are worse. And you th if you think you can devalue your your currency, wait till you see what we can do to ours. That's not much of a help either. So I'll just go back to the. I'll leave the quartile in. There you go. There's a green quartile. That's not bad. Um. They're much better at managing their currency than we are at managing ours. By the way. I haven't done any projections on the end, to be honest with you, uh, but I will. I'll go back and do them for you. But it'd be pretty easy to do. What if we just did this one? Let's just do the silly one. I mean, it's right in front of us. We're close to the one-to-one. -one. Look at 1.618. That's a long ways, man. Seventy end to the dollar. Oh boy. Oh yeah, I. Hey, let me just tell you. Old high is seventy-five. I pushed it. Trust me, I know it. That's when the Fed called us and said, "Just keep going until we tell you to stop." And then at the end of your uh, shift, at about six o'clock at night, the Japanese would start to come in. Actually, Eduardo, you want you want you want to hear a funny story? Here, I'll give you one real, real funny story here before I then do what we talk about the chart. I actually bought yen. Ron Carlson says that one day it was 350 to the, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was 350 to the to, to the buck, yep. Um, I actually bought yen, sold dollars for the Fed, two handles lower than it officially ever traded. How about that? Yes, absolutely. They called us up. How? Yeah, it's pretty funny, huh? Here's how it goes. They called us up and said, sell $200 million at the market. Well, I, I'll i tell you what. No, there's there's a bank. I called. At, you can call another. Gen Jennifer, are you here? She may not be here. I haven't seen her this morning. Another ex-market maker. Um I called the bank, and uh, my my Asian contact. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but that's a different story, and I'll tell you I'll tell you that story someday because I'll put that on the website because that's a piece of history that should never be lost. Famous trader by the name of Boom Boom at Bank Boomi Putra. Probably the best yen trader that ever lived. I called Boom Boom and told him I needed a price on two hundred million dollars against the yen. It was about 45 minutes, maybe an hour, before the Japanese market was opening on a Sunday night. And people were very skittish because there were all kinds of rumors. And the Fed told me, I don't care what the price is, sell $200 million because we want to get this market rocking. And he made me a choice price. He was a Malaysian. He's, not a, he's dead now, but yes, he was. His son is still around. And I'm proud to say that his son... His son speaks to Sim. Do you know the name of it where you have uh, busts of your ancestors behind you and then you worship them and then ask them for uh, uh, for guidance? You know what I'm talking about. We can talk about it another time. Anyway, 
I asked Boom Boom for a price on $200 million. She made me a choice price, which amongst market makers means you are obligated to deal. You lose face if you don't deal. And the last price was 75 and change. He made me a, a choice price of 73, something like 35. 75, 73, 35 bid, 73, 35 offer. Tim, what would you like to do? Yep. <laughs> and I said, I hope this works out for you, boom, boom. I sell you $200 million. And he laughed into the phone. He goes, I hope this is for your buddies. He knew what I was doing. And I said, yes, it is. And he goes, okay, let me know if you got more to do. And he hung up the phone. And when the market opened, about, I called the Fed, gave him the price. When the market opened at 75 and a half, <laughs> so they were already 200 points out of the money. They call me back and they go, what's going to happen? Did you sell it $200 million? I said, sure, I'll send you a copy of the ticket if you want. I told them I sold it to. And they said, I said, do you want to do some more? And they said, uh, no, we're fine, thank you. <laughs> so I called Boom Boom back and said, hey, Boom Boom, do you got a price on $100 million for me? And I think the price was about 75 75 at that point. He goes, sure. 7501 choice. I said, I take $100 million. And he said, I get the message, which means the Fed was no longer selling. And boom, boom, pushed it up to, I think it closed lunchtime above 80. He ran it right back in their face. And I left my orders with him, went to sleep, took my profit. But we managed to sell $200 million, 200 pips below the all time lows. I just think. I, 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 that's one of those tickets I still have, actually. Did he work in Singapore or Tokyo? No, he worked at Bank Bumi Putra, which is in Malaysia. Sim, you, you know where that's at. Yeah, all right. I mean... Amongst currency dealers, it's a famous bank. Amongst a lot of people that are not big speculators, it's not a famous bank. But amongst currency dealers, in the 80s and 90s, Boom Boom was the man, let me just tell you. Um, Boomi Putra at that point was big because of Boom Boom. No, he didn't... He Well... He, he was able to run it up on a Sunday night because everybody thought that the central banks were going to sell, so they probably all got short. When I called him back and paid him, I was sending him a message back because he was friend, a friend saying, hey, they sold it to me once, and when I asked him if they wanted to do some more, they said no. So I think all's clear. And I went long $100 million myself, believe me. I don't know how much he went long, but he went long plenty. Yeah, squeeze, exactly. And everybody that was short because they thought the Fed and the Bank of Japan were going to step in and now realize that they had no appetite for it, got caught. And I, some of you may wonder, why would they step out of the market? Remember, I've said this before, and some of you may have missed it because you weren't around or because you're new. Part of the reason that the Fed intervenes and the Bank of Japan intervenes is to get prices to go to a certain level. But another one of their goals is to make that market untradeable. So they may have sacrificed some price, but they may have also felt happy because they were flushing speculators out of the market. So it was kind of a moral victory. How's that? A big wash and rinse. Damn right. Big expensive wash and rinse. Uh, let's do uh, commodities real quick, and then I'm going to go get fitted for orthotics. Uh, let's just see what's going on. Do, 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 do. Open up. Let's go. Punish trend follow for Yeah. You know, they like to make it untradeable. Well, here we go in the hoggies. We want to see it come back up here. Test and close with some separation. Then we're going to get short some hogs. These are feb hogs. And we'll be looking for 10 to 15 cents on the downside. What's the width of this? Let's take a look. 51, 
61. We'll be looking for 9 to 10 cents, it looks like. What I'd like it to do is come, test, close with some separation, maybe even take out this low, but certainly close with some separation. So let's take a look. I'm gonna, we're going to go to Golden Crude next. That's just what happened to be that was what was there. Uh, gold. So that's a daily. I'm sorry, it's, it's crude, sorry. Excuse me. Here is a weekly. Oh, got to fix my charts. Now, if anybody wants to know, let me just refresh it real quick. There we go. If anybody wants to know why I was willing to get long at 35 bucks, and why Sean, who was just doing crayon drawing, saw the same thing I saw, and I ran this up. You guys watched me run this up to 71 and change. This wasn't that hard. Look at the crayon drawing. That's the top of this old range. Not this old house, this old range. If you go back and look, it's basically, this is this is T. Boone, by the way, getting divorced. Right about here. His wife thought he was crazy. He was buying everything that moved. And he fell out of the fortune five, five four hundred, and she went nuts. And uh, he made a settlement down here. That's the good news. Anyway, this was the trading range for the longest time, basically 11 or 12 bucks up to around 25, 30 bucks. We had a couple spikes up here. Now, what was resistance becomes support. When we got down here, to me and Sean both, this was a no-brainer. Well, no, he didn't lose 85% of his fund, Eduardo. It was marked to the market at 85%. He never lost 85% of his fund. That's when his wife bailed on him. So she, she got out at the bottom, just so you know. <laughs> she, he's married to the guy for 47 years and get, got out at the bottom. Good for her. I hope she enjoyed her pittance. Because when he was selling at 140 and 145... Uh, you know, don't believe what you read, Eduardo. He's a very private person. And uh, the stuff in the stuff that you read in the press is speculation. Almost all of his um, his money, money is his own private investment. So you, you wouldn't be able to actually get. So you can see what Sean was looking at. Simple crayon drawing. This base got down here. Pretty simple stuff. The question, the only question is, if you got long down in here, once it moves into the vertical territory, how high can it go? And in fact, we did get out 71 and a quarter, and we certainly look smart. But this thing could just keep going vertical. Who knows where it's going? Doesn't this climb now look a lot like this climb? With a little bit of pause that refreshes, now it's making new highs? Or am I seeing ghosts? You can tell me. It's okay. Let's look at gold weekly. I mean, what are you going to say? <laughs> yeah, that gold just keeps falling. You know, yeah, they're doing such a good job pushing that gold lower. Yeah, 
We're we're not on the way up in gold at all. Yep. Ouch. And what are you supposed to say here? How do I get in? Why didn't I get in here? Why didn't I get in here? <laughs> I mean, oh my God. Mark Anderberg, if you don't like the way gold is going, just turn your monitor over. There you go. How about, there's another. <laughs> yeah, long, long at 295. There you go, Andy. How about this? It's got to, this, this, this has got to be over because we're running out of charting paper. So this trend has to be over. How about that? My, I'm out of monitor space, so this, this is over. Richard, spend in good health. How's that? Resistance at monitor top. Yeah, I'll have to have Mary put that in the. Uh... <laughs> I don't use log scales, but you can. Absolutely. Can I draw a median line here? Sure. Uh, you know, pick your poison. You, you can do the big daddy. I don't know what the heck it's going to do for you. You can go. Well, I guess I'd have to make that do that one correctly. There we go. You can do. I was looking at another one here. Let's just do the single, the simple correction. That one's not bad. You can see the quartile was respected nicely. The median line was respected nicely. And now we come, we've become more efficient to the upside. We're blasting out highs. Took out this canyon rim, no problem. The quartile was a great area to get long. We butted against the median line a couple times, and now we've just taking it out on our way up any speculation as to high how high it will go uh, I said 1150 and of course we're just about there and then I said 1500 uh, one thing one sure thing about uh, market mark says one sure thing about gold there's no way to draw a down sloping median line that should tell you something right there Vince says 2000 my buddies in China tell me that I don't understand I'm Caucasian They've been trading gold for 10,000 years. Gold's going to 5,000 without breathing hard. I'm going there. I, I'm, I'm willing to defer to them. How about that? Gold bubble? I don't know. What would cause a gold bubble? Bring up Pop-Tarts. The Pop-Tart man is here. I'll be up in a few minutes, buddy. <laughs> 5,000 years is a long time. Yes, he is. He's early. Well, he's out of Pop-Tarts, that's why. We're in a gold bubble, are we? Well, we'll see. Here's the problem, though. Are we in a gold, bu are, are we in a gold bubble? Because the big institutions are short out there. You know what? And if there's actually demand... If there's real demand, and there seems to be, I don't don't see it that way. Dollar bill bubble, yeah, I, I I'd go there. U.S. bond bubble, I'd go there. Silver, seventy cent below its all-time high. Well, there you go. Bubble usually means oversupply versus demand. We're nowhere near a bubble. I I would agree with you, Shabir. And I know Andy's about to say no counterparty risk to gold. There you go. All right, um, I'll do the over chart. There's no reason to really because nothing really has changed, but I'll, I'll put it up, and then we're going to call it a day because I'm going to go get some shoes fitted. How's that? The, the hairdressers are not yet talking about gold, so there's no bubble. 
Well, I haven't talked to my hairdresser recently, but okay. Here's the Dow. And you can see it's making it made new highs. No, no, it didn't. Yes, it did. And somebody said that yesterday. It'll make new highs and then say aloha. This chart is there we go. So we're coming up to the 50%. Remember, 1929, we went to the 52% pullback. And Andrew says, yep. Edward, Edward I, don't, I, I love it when you remind me that. Andrew says, upper median line. Let's extend it out. Wrong way, Peach Fuzz. There we go. Upper median line, 10,500, 10,600. They'd be right at about 52%. That's the pullback in 1929. Then we made new lows. Wouldn't that be fascinating? And 10,500 is the one-to-one -one move, Jordan says. Hey, Jordan, how are you? Right, 1929 pullback on the chart. Yes, sir. There you go. Well, I don't. I see. I'm not. I'm not bullish or bearish on the stock market. To me, it's nonsensical. How's that? There are easier things for me to trade. Well, I'm not trading anything right now because I'm coming off of seven, seven weeks of bad health. But um, I'm not bearish or bullish. It's nonsensical to me. Yet, that being said, I see no sign of weakness. Before I'm going to get interested in this, you're going to have to either convince me that the sell-off is over, or, and that means the economy's got to turn around, or you're going to have to show me some weakness. And I haven't seen any weakness for a long time and flat to me is a viable position it's interesting that everyone thinks 1929 John Kelly says but right now it's just an uptrend on a chart John let me just say one thing to you I don't know how old you are and, it does, and it's meaningless but I do know this history repeats itself and those that do not know history are doomed to repeat history over and over and our government is filled with people, including Ben Bernanke, that do not know their history. Period. I don't know what depression he studied, but it wasn't the 1929 depression. Because if you take a look at the re at the problems that, it, that exasperated the 1929 depression, he has put into place, piece by piece, Every single piece of legislation and every problem. Every single one. It's like he's reading it out of the book and doing it. So, again, I don't have an opinion. If you ask me, am I going to put my money on a short right now? No, I don't see any weakness. But, you know, I, I do not have to be. I'm a fund manager. I have the luxury of not having to chase other fund managers. I don't have to be long the stock market. So I'm not long the stock market. There was a point where I was long the stock market, and I made a lot of money in, in bank stocks because I thought they'd prop them up, and sure enough, they did. Now I'm flat. I don't know where this thing's going to stop. You can't convince me yet that this stock market rally is going to continue. Maybe I'll change my mind. Right now, I don't have a clue. Paul says, Paul McManus, with the big players borrowing money at 0% and buying stocks thereby pushing up the price, what happens when a black swan shows up that causes treasuries to spike up? Well, you know, one possibility would be uh, gold defaults. How about that? Do I see any symmetry in this market?
I see a lot of problems at this 10,500. How about that? Doesn't mean it's going to stop. What I'd like it to do is get to this 10,500. Then show some weakness. But just because I want that doesn't mean I'm going to get it. That's what I'll be watching for. Yeah, that, that's why that blue line is up here. This is where price should run out of energy. Yep. But let me see it run out of energy. Look, if it's going to turn down, i got lots of room to make money. Let it turn down before I get interested. Okay. Okay, I'm, uh, i I got to run my... I've already... I've gotten three time to go from Pop-Tart Boy. <laughs> I, I got to... Talk to my doctor about swimming to improve your managing of oxygen. Yes, absolutely. Kurt, please. Yeah, drop me an email. Kurt, I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm not, I'm actually, I'm a pretty good swimmer. Yes, I, I, th I appreciate all the good thoughts, and I am better. Things are going much better. And, uh, again, I guess I'll get the pop darts when I head up. Um, no, I don't, they won't be cool looking. They'll be very clunky looking shoes, but that's okay. I'll feel better. Pop tarts will keep their value. That's why I'm a big investor in pop tarts. You guys have a great day. It's hump day. Tomorrow, Paul is going to do currencies for 15, 20 minutes and also talk about the website. Paul, later on today, you and I will have a uh, phone discussion. When I'm a little more uh, cogent, I need to do uh, my meds after I get back from the dock, and then I'll call you. All of you, take. oh, I, I, exercise is kind of limited until I have shoes, but that's where we're hurrying on the shoes. Have a great day. I'll let you know what's going on via the website, and I'll see you in the morning. Krishna, email me again to remind me, and I will tell you the whole shot. How about that? I'll see you in the morning. Have a great day. Good trading. I'm Tim Moore, MarketGeometry.com. I'm out of here.